Hello, and welcome to the Infinite Love Podcast. This is a place where we share how love can transform negative emotions and pain into strength. We talk about all things related to love, positivity, and kindness. And I am your host, Corinne Kamara. Welcome to episode eight, From Breast Cancer to Breast Awareness. Today, we are talking to Leslie Ferris Yerber. She is a TED Talk speaker, first-time author of Probably Benign, and a woman's advocate with a laser-focused mission. Leslie was diagnosed with stage 4 breast cancer in November 2017 after an all-clear mammogram and ultrasound. Experiencing the first-hand failing of our current breast cancer screening technologies, she is now determined to advocate the next generation in breast cancer screening so that her story doesn't become your story. Leslie wants every woman to have access to the breast screening that is right for them. One in eight women are diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetimes. And if it's caught early, it could be curable. It's a lofty goal, but attainable. Today, we're going to learn about different ways that we can get screened for breast cancer, a very important topic. Let's get into the episode. Thank you so much for agreeing to do the Infinite Love Podcast. Welcome, Leslie. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be on your show. Um, Well, I'm 58 years old and um, almost three years ago now, I have to get used to saying three instead of two. um, I was, you know, sort of had the the shock of my life. Uh, November of 2017, it was, I was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, which at that point is incurable, as most people know. Um, And that was two months after, and one of those all clear mammograms and ultrasounds um, that, you know, we're sort of led to believe find all of our cancers. Um, That's why we get, that's why we get screening, right? Is is to find them. And, um, but I came to realize, you know, after a long diagnosis and verification and all this kind of stuff that happens when, you know, when you, when you find out you have something like that, that there's a lot about our current breast cancer screening modalities and processes left to be desired. Um, And that is because a lot of women with dense breasts are not well served enough by mammography. And so that's kind of what my life has become, you know, not so much to be a, you know, a cancer patient or something like that, but to really use my story to, to tell, um, you know, anyone who, you know, might need to get screened for breast cancer that you need to be aware about your breast density. So important. I have dense breast and your story definitely made me think twice about when I have those types of exams for sure. Absolutely. So important. Yeah. So would you say that this was your love lesson? A love lesson is a painful life situation that helped you transform your life in a positive way to then help uplift others. Well, I think so, because, you know, um, when you learn that you have something like this, that's incurable and that's just treatable, you, you kind of, you go through a lot in your head, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I even walked uh, an ancient pilgrimage across the top of Spain called the Camino de Santiago to just give me the room and the space and all of that to, to think about these things and how I wanted to be, how I wanted to react, what I wanted to do, what I wanted to say, what I wanted, didn't say, um, you know, to really solidify all that and get it into place for myself. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, I came to the decision that, I mean, I want to choose the, I guess, positive route instead of negative route. Right. And I think that you can say positive route is love or much more loving than going the anger, possibly legal route. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it wasn't a hard decision for me to make, um, but it is one that I consciously made. Um, And so I think helping the world through information and forming and using my story to help other people Mm -hmm. is a form of love. And so that's what I chose. 
um, in the face of everything else that I've, you know, been through. So I yes, I, I think that is a love story in a way. It is. It is yeah. a really important lesson. And how did you do, what'd you do about your treatment? How would you go, at, what, when you found out the diagnosis, how did you choose to treat it? Right. Well, um, since my uh, cancer is stage four, it has meta metastasized, hard word to say, um, into the bones. Um, nowhere else that we know of right now in the body. Um, that's what stage four really means. And it's, it's left the primary spot of where it started and it has gone elsewhere in the body. So that is what we screen for to prevent. So a lot of people don't even realize, or maybe they haven't even thought about the idea that you cannot die of breast cancer that's in your breasts. Oh. It's just not possible. But your, your breasts are not, they're not a vital organ. I mean, we want to keep them, but we can do without them. A lot of people, you know, have had mastectomies and they go on just fine. So you cannot really die of breast cancer that has not left the breast and gone somewhere else. So mm -hmm. that is what the screening is really for. That's what all the harsh chemo is about. That's what all the surgery is about. Um, that's what all that is for is to keep it from going somewhere else into the body. So since mm -hmm. mine had already gone to somewhere else in the body, mm -hmm. then I didn't really need to have a mastectomy or a lumpectomy or any of those kinds of things. So the treatment really changes. It changes a lot once it's left the breast and gone somewhere else, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to if it's still in the breast. So I didn't have to have surgery because kind of like that ship already sailed, if that makes sense. Totally, uh, Yes. So I do um, what they call endocrine therapy, which is just a hormonal treatment. It's a pill. Mm -hmm. And then I take another drug called Ibrant, which is simply put like a cell growth inhibitor. And you take those two together. Yeah. It's actually on TV advertised a lot. Of, if anybody watches TV is listening, it's the one where they say um, a lot has changed, but a lot hasn't. That's their mm -hmm. little tagline made by Pfizer. Um, I'll be on it. Um, coming up on three years now, and it has been working well for me without too many side effects. Oh, so that's, that's all I do. So I haven't lost my hair. You know, um, my white cell count is a little bit low, and so we have to keep track of that. But otherwise, you know, not too bad. Not mm -hmm. too bad so far. You know, when that stops working, we have to go to something else. Then I don't know what, you know, but mm -hmm. that's all it's mm -hmm. been so far, and it, and it is working. Thank you, Pfizer. <laughs> I'm glad that it's working we can, for you. We can, we can say what we want about Big Pharma, but I like this pill quite a bit, <laughs> you know, because it's working. So. so would you say if you had a different type of testing earlier, earlier on in your health, you would, have been, you would have been able to catch the cancer sooner? Right. Well, that's part of what um, my message is and part of what I advocate for and all the work that I do. It's in the book that I read. I did some fundraising for these, what I call them next generation technologies mm -hmm. that do more than just anatomically look at your breast like a mammogram does. Really, the mammogram is just a different name for an x-ray. It's just an x-ray. So it sees everything that's there, regardless of what it is. So we all have uh, our unique level of density in our breasts and density looks white on a mammogram mm -hmm. and cancer also looks white on a mammogram. So, oh. so it gets masked and tied up together to where you can't really tell one from the other. And that's because it's just looking at the anatomical makeup of your breast because it's just an x-ray. These other things, um, one's called molecular breast imaging, and there are a couple others, contrast enhanced mammography and MRIs. They look at your breast in a different way. It's mm -hmm. more of a functional thing. So molecular breast imaging, for instance, it um, sends a tracer to cells that are more molecularly active than the rest of your breast. Okay. Cancer is more active than the rest of our cells. That's why it grows so rapidly, right? Mm -hmm. And it lights those up and then uses a certain camera to see it. And that's how it does. And it's completely impervious to, to breast density. The density does not matter. Oh. So for women with dense breasts, these things are really, really important. I'm, and I'm hoping that someday, and I hope to hurry that along, that women like you 
and the millions and millions of many other women with dense breasts will be able to take advantage of these things as part of their routine screening so that we can find those cancers early because we still don't have a cure. Once, right. it, once it's gone into the rest of the body, we do not have a cure for it yet. I mean, you know, we've been talking about a cure for how many decades now mm -hmm. and we still don't have it. So we have to find it early and we need to do a better job. Absolutely. Yeah. So how, where do people, where can people take these tests? I mean, I've never heard of that. So where yeah. is it available? Yeah. How, is there something that is that, does insurance pay for it? Well, um, molecular breast imaging, M Medicare and Medicaid do pay for it. Oh, great. Okay. So that's always a first big step, right? Mm -hmm. Um, if they pay for it, then, you know, then you're, you're, you're better off and, you know, maybe getting an insurance company to pay for it, but you know, it's covered sometimes but not always it depends mm -hmm. on the situation and kind of what the insurance company feels like and what plan you have etc um the mayo clinic invented this technology okay um and so obviously if you're if you're near a mayo clinic then you know, then it, it's there mm -hmm. um and it's at about 30 or 40 other sites around the country not very many mm -hmm. not very many um but i think the bigger issue is is our governing bodies like the ACR and some of these other organizations that recommend what should happen for the public health need to catch up with us right. and start recommending these things. Once that happens, then the imaging facilities will follow along and it will be more readily available. But there's a lot of work to do to get that done. Mm -hmm. A lot of work to do. And I spend a lot of my days working on that. Yes. So. It's not easy to get something like this into, you know, the, the norm. Very, very no. difficult. It takes many, many years. Probably longer in, than it should. Absolutely. So then in the meanwhile, people, women have to advocate this for themselves through education. Absolutely. And that's what yeah. you're doing, pretty much spreading the word so women can Absolutely. Understand. If there's any one message that people can take away from what I say, that is find out your breast density. Many, 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 I'm going to say most people don't know their breast density. Mm -hmm. There are four basic categories. Two of them are dense and two of them are not. If you're dense, you need to understand how dense you are um, and speak with your doctor about supplemental screening. Just mm -hmm. imagine if every woman did just that in the United States, who's of the right age and all of that, um, to be getting screening in the first place, what a huge difference that would make just to start the conversation with every GP, every OBGYN out there. But every woman goes in and says, I want to know what my breast density is and I want to know what you have for supplemental screening for me because what I now know is the um, mammograms will find less than half of all cancers in women with dense breast tissue. Whoa. Does that not frighten you? Yeah, because I have dense breasts because I'm like, yikes, I need to. And that is, I mean, that's that. just not me saying this. This is a, this is a proven, well-documented, correct statistic. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit more or less than half, but mm -hmm. we all say less than half. Yeah. Less than the toss of a coin. And mm -hmm. that's not very good for screening. No. For women no. with dense breasts. And here's the kicker about all of it. The more dense you are, the more likely you are to get breast cancer to begin with. Right. That is a factor. So that's kind of like a double whammy, right? Right. It's not only does the mammogram not see my cancer, mm -hmm. but I'm more likely to have it. Mm -hmm. Ouch. Right. That yes. is, that is, that is the problem. That is a big, big problem. So those most likely to have it are the least served by mammography from a density point of view. There are other factors, mm -hmm. you know, like family history, genetics, and that sort of thing. But, yeah. but that's, that's really two convert confounding factors that make this a really big issue. Right. I mean, it's something I thought of, I've been thinking about since my early twenties, I've had dense, I've had fibrocystic breasts yeah. and I've really worked on creating a different pattern with my breasts. Like I don't wear wide bras. Like I do breast massage. I just, I'm always 
wanting to make sure that they stay soft and, and supple yeah. and mm-hmm. always going to the doc. I, I mean, I go to the GYN every year to get breast checks. Like I'm pretty on it because I know of that. And now yeah. I know that it's a different type of test for me. That's so in, enlightening. Yeah. That's so important to know. Yeah. Because I definitely for somebody know like that. you who are, you know, who's very dense breast, it's just really, really difficult to see cancer in there on a mammogram. So one lady that I work with, she's a doctor, she's a radiologist in New York City. And here's how, here's how she characterizes trying to find cancer in a very dense breast on a mammogram. She says, it's like trying to find a white bunny in a snowstorm. Oh God. That's bunny terrible. can be out there hopping around everywhere and you can't see it because it's right. white on white. Right. That's the problem. That's yeah. The yeah. Whew. Right. We all should know this. We, we all should. Our density, like we know our heartbeat or blood pressure mm-hmm. or cholesterol and all these other, you know, health things. Mm-hmm. Um, but the word is getting out there, but it's not, it hasn't gotten out there fast enough. And we all need to know this. And like you just said, we have to advocate for ourselves because right now the medical community is not doing a good job at advocating for us. Right. So, yeah. I'm so um, proud and happy that you've come to this place of understanding and really are taking this information and sharing it with others because that is so important. Like you learn something, it, it changes your life. And then now you're like, hey, I'm going to share this information with others because it's so important that everyone needs to know. Yeah. Thank you. And it feels good to do it. I mean, I think I would, if I weren't doing it, I think... Mm-hmm. I would, I don't know, there would be some sort of dissonance happening in me mm. because I would know that there's something that I, you know, learned the hard way that other people need to know and they, I just need to tell them, you right. know, so I do podcasts, you know, mm. I, I write blogs, I wrote my book, I give talks, you know, all this kind of stuff, all these different ways of getting the message out there in hopes that it re- reaches the maximum number of people possible. Yes. You found your purpose through this painful experience. You found your purpose. So tell me about your book. Oh, thank you. Well, it's called probably benign. Is that Uh a catchy name or what? Probably (laughs) benign. That's a very good Um, name. (laughs) And um, like I said before, I walked the Camino de Santiago a couple Mm -hmm. years ago. Now I started on September 16th, 2018. So that's almost two years ago. Um, And I walked for 40 days. And, you know, a lot of reckoning with not knowing what my future is going to hold and all that kind of thing. Um, And I did fundraising for a large, massive study that they're doing on molecular breast imaging at the Mayo Clinic. Um, And then I just learned a lot about myself um, through the whole process. And so many Camino books are, you know, day 13 got up and had toast, walked three miles, sat down, had coffee, walked another seven miles and saw a church. It's not that, you know, like it's not a chronicle of my days. It is okay. more of a metaphorical, you know, it's, it, I, I sort of parallel um, the metaphor of doing the Camino de Santiago mm-hmm. with the journey of breast cancer screening in the journey of um, my diagnosis. So there's, mm-hmm. you know, two or three themes constantly running through it. Um, mm-hmm. But metaphorically, and really, it does start at the beginning of the Camino and end when I end it. So okay. um, yeah, I poured my heart and soul into it. It's called Probably Benign. And um, it's, it's a quick read. It's like, it's 100 pages. It's not thick. It's not long. And, but I just found, I can say what I want to say in that amount of time. So why take mm-hmm. more pages? you know, (laughs) and and everybody's, everybody wants small and fast now. Right. So really, um, yeah. So, so I stuck to that. Um, and I, I do zoom book club things, you know, if people want to do a a book club or if they want me to speak to their group, then I obviously now everything's zoom because of Mm -hmm. COVID. So, um, so I do that a lot. So that offer is always out there to anyone who wants it. Okay. Yeah. So what was, um, tell me what you emotionally went through on that journey. Cause that pilgrimage of 40 days, 40 days is a powerful number. Yes. It's a biblical number. Yes. <laughs> so yes. what was, can you describe a little bit of your internal 
struggle and what transformation occurred on this pilgrimage on the other side of the fort. Right. Um, so, and I talk about this in the book too, the pilgrimage is really, it, it's really divided into three sections. So, mm -hmm. so the first one is called the physical section. Um, and it's the physical section because you've first started and it's also the hardest part. Right. On the first day is the hardest. It's hardest because it's first and it's hardest because it's just the hardest. It's up, up and then down. Um, all in one day. And so, you know, I kind of liken that to when you first get your diagnosis, it's the hardest because you're in such shock and you don't know what to do and you're weary and it's just exhausting and tiring and all that. So, you know, there's kind of that parallel there. Um, so the first maybe 13 days are the physical. And then the second, um, it flattens out into what they call the Meseta in Spain, which Meseta means high plain. So it's slightly elevated to sea level, but it's flat. And so it's days and days of wheat and corn and hay flat, you know, and people call that the mental section. You know, that's where you start yeah. to work out, you know, okay, um, acceptance, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and you think it's never going to end. You don't know when you're going to get there. It feels monotonous. It feels, you know, so there's a lot that goes on in, in that section. Um, and then the last part is called the spiritual section. Mm -hmm. um, and that is where I began to really feel like, okay, you know, back in the physical section, I really wasn't hundred percent sure I was going to make it, you know, um, because it was hard. It was, you know, the end was far away. I didn't know if my feet were going to hold up. Who knows? You can twist an ankle. I mean, a million things can happen, right? Well, right. by the time we get, I got to the spiritual part, you know, the last third, I was like, I, I'm going to make it, you know, unless something really happens, I am going to, I'm actually going to do this. And that's where I really started to feel the whole, you know, sort of a weight off my shoulders in a lot of ways as I headed toward the, you know, finish line, if you will, yeah. because I knew I was going to make it. I had decided, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make this my life purpose you know, and I'm going to do it with, you know, compassion. Um, and I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to love it. Um, and I just started to also feel this whole thing about, I'm just one speck of humanity that has walked this way. And many people before me have done it. And many people ahead of me will do it. And I know I'm just, I'm just one of them, but I'm going to leave my Mark, this is what I'm going to do for everyone coming after me. Um, and so very, very, very spiritual in that way. And I think if I walked it again, I, it would be a totally different experience because right. it's only that one place in time where you have that experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, and everybody's having their own experience. So that's yeah. what's so cool about it. Everybody's having their own experience. They're an individual, but together, you know, we were all kind of going to that same place. It's kind of hard to explain, but I hope it made some sense what I said. No, it totally did. And I love the fact that you actually did something physical to transform yeah. something that's happening emotional because breast cancer is a physical, it's a physical illness. Absolutely. So you actually did, you actually did a physical act to actually create a transformation, an internal yeah. transformation, which I think is really powerful. And I yeah. often something I suggest to people like when you want to make a change, make a physical change to help Absolutely. really enforce what's happening on the emotion. It really level. makes a lot of sense. I think walking is, it's exercise, but it's not incredibly strenuous, right? So right. our bodies are made for walking. We can walk a long way. Right. You know, because back in the day, you know, people walked a lot more than we do now. Totally. Um, and our bodies are, are made for movement. And so I think it's just a really good physical Get your, gets the blood flowing enough that your mind mm -hmm. starts working and you can do some of these things. Um, and the landscape is beautiful, you know? Right. Um, it's, it's a very good metaphor walking a distance like that for the journey that you take internally as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. facing those physical issues like water, all those survival things yeah. that also bring up a lot of emotion. Absolutely. Yeah. There's just really a lot to it and it's different for everybody. 
Yeah. So um, I encourage anybody to go on a journey like that. If not the Camino de Santiago, then, you know, another type of thing. And most people can't take 40 days, but, you know, maybe in, even in a week, I think, you know, you can get some of that if you decide that you're going to set yourself up for it and, and try. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they can do, people can do something smaller, like deciding every day I walk for an hour to really yeah. start to process whatever's happening in my life. Absolutely. absolutely. I feel like movement is such, is such a big part of feeling better, like just getting your body to move. Absolutely. Yeah. It made all the difference for me. And then the, just the outdoors and the fresh air too. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, and the scenery, <laughs> Being in nature. Mountains, I mean, even the hay was beautiful. You yeah. know, the hundred miles of hay had its own beauty. <laughs> <laughs> nature definitely has its healing abilities. That's right. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. That's so beautiful. I love, I just love that. And I really encourage people to read your book. I think that's such Thank an you. amazing story to really. Thank you. Yeah. Amen. Um, certainly it's on Amazon. Um, and then also the website, probably benign.com. Okay. You know, you can buy one copy or certainly if you're going to buy, you know, multiple copies for like a book club or something like that, I would go to probably benign.com because they give a, you know, a discount for people who are buying multiple for their book clubs or meetings or whatever. So um, okay. you're going to, if you're gonna buy multiple, I'd go that I'd go that route. Probably <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So I wanna ask you a little bit about more about love, since this is the infinite love show. Yes. Um, how do you use love in the work that you do? Well, I I wind up talking to a lot of people who have just been diagnosed because they all reach out, you know. So um I definitely use it that way and take all the time that I need to or really they need to, um, you know, to talk to them. Um, and I just, I, I feel like my work is sort of a labor of love, you know, no matter whether I'm writing a blog or writing a Facebook post or whatever, um, you know, because I'm, I'm trying to share what I know and have come to, to learn through my own experience with everybody that I know for their own benefit. Right. It's old news for me. I mean, it's not going to do me any good. Right. But, right. <laughs> but it will other people. Creating a community. I love that. Yeah. Okay. Um, how, well, we kind of talked about this already, but how do you feel like your work is helping to serve humanity? Well, I hope that, you know, I can get this out to enough people mm -hmm. that it, you know, makes a difference for, for people in a couple ways and even three ways that I can three it, think of. One is I want them to feel empowered enough mm -hmm. and informed enough to advocate for themselves. And so once you start advocate, advocating for yourself, then you do it more and more and more. Yes. In whatever it is, whether it's, yeah. you know, getting the proper, you know, repairs on your car or, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, that goes far and wide. It does. So if, if, you know, I can help people feel empowered to, you know, advocate for themselves regardless of what it's about, I think that's really big. But the more specific thing is, you know, if someone can find their cancer earlier, right? You know, certainly before it reaches stage four, but even finding it at a stage zero or one versus a two or three is quite a big difference in treatment. Huge. You Huge. know, that's mm -hmm. the difference between having a little lumpectomy, you know, and getting back to work in a couple of weeks versus taking a whole year out for chemo, radiation, being sick, you know. That is a huge impact to someone's life. People yeah. lose their jobs, mm. you know, right. if, if, if their cancer coverage isn't, isn't good enough, then they lose a lot of money. Some people go bankrupt. I mean, this is serious stuff, mm -hmm. you know, it can have a huge impact to people. Um, and I really just have to keep the faith that that is happening and will continue to happen. Because when you, you know, broadcast a message out, right. it doesn't always circle back to you. Hey, because of you, I talked to my doctor about this and my cancer. You don't, you know, you don't get that feedback loop usually, right. you know, so you just mm -hmm. got to send it out there and have the faith that it's making a difference. It is. Absolutely. And I mean, no. you, you just made a difference in my life. Yeah. 
Because now I'm going to think about my breasts in a totally different way. And, and I'm yeah. going to look for those, that, those testing that you mentioned. And yeah, and if you, I'll put the information in the show notes as well. Like, Absolutely. Because yes. yeah. I think it's so important. Yeah. <clears throat> and so what does it mean for you? Because I don't know what you did before this journey, but how has this made you feel like you're a positive force of goodness in the world? Well, you know, just to be honest, I, you know, before my diagnosis, I was kind of wondering, you know, like, what am I, you know, what have I really done to make a difference? And, you know, I was getting ready to make a change with what I did and I wasn't quite sure what to do. And I was really wondering about that. And then boom comes along this diagnosis and it's a terrible diagnosis. I mean, I don't wish it upon anyone, um, but it did make clear to me you know, what, what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. And that's a gift, you know, yes. to, to, yeah. to know that, you know, kind of what you were put here for. Right. And so, um, that's a gift. And so I'm gift. grateful for that. Um, no matter how it came about. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, know, you found so, your purpose. Yeah. Yeah. So now we have a little bit of fun questions. It's about you okay. personally. <laughs> okay. okay, here we go. What do you love most about your life? Uh, my family. Okay. We have fun. I have three grown kids now and I just, I love watching their, you know, <clears throat> maturing process and what they're doing <laughs> and, you know, all that kind of stuff and helping them in a different way than when they were little. Nice. Any grandkids yeah. yet? Not yet. I have two <laughs> grand cats. Oh, nice. They're very cute. Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel you receive love? Um, huh. Well, um, I think about the love languages, you know, the five long love yes. languages, that book. And I don't know if I could give you all five of them right now, but two of them um, resonate with me. Let's see. Um, words of affirmation. Yes. And time. Quality time. Yes. Quality time. Mm -hmm. you know, gifts, physical gifts, I don't care too much about, mm -hmm. you know, and consequently, I'm not a very good gift giver either because, you know, like we give what we right. want, you know what I'm saying? Right. So, um, but yeah, I think those two are, are really the way I receive it. So when somebody calls me and says, Hey, let's go out to lunch or let's take a walk or, you know, I'm that I love because that's time. Right. You know? Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Mm -hmm. So when do you feel the most love? Oh, I think when my family's all together and we're, you know, sharing a meal or playing a game or, or something like that. It's, that's my, those are my happy times. Does your family live close to you? No, no. All the kids are, I'm in Chicago and they're um, kind of on the East coast, okay. East coast and South. So we've got to really make an effort to all get together. So, so holidays are really important. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. So where has love created a miracle in your life? Oh, I think we've covered it. You know, I think yeah. um, just the, the journey that I've been on and, mm -hmm. and, you know, what I've chosen to do with it, you know, I think is, um, is a story of love in a way. Mm -hmm. Although I don't usually talk about it in that way. Right. Um, except for now, which is a, it's, <laughs> it's a great, it's a great way to think about it though. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, it's my sharing of what I know so that it can make, you know, an impact for other people. Are you religious or spiritual? Yeah. I mean, kind of, I go to church, um, very spiritual, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't, I don't have a lot of rules around my religion, you know, <laughs> um, I think about it a little differently, but, um, okay. Yeah, somewhere in there I am. Because you talked a lot about faith, so I was just wondering if no, if your no. if your relationship with God was part of your faith and your and part of your that gave you some strength to move forward. Yeah, I mean, I think about it as more of like you know the world being all impacting each other, mm -hmm. and you know um, the we is greater than the I. Right. That whole you know way of thinking is kind of largely how I think about it on a daily basis. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. love that. Well, thank you so much, Leslie. This has been so informative and you definitely changed my life and I'm sure you'll change other 
millions of other women's lives, giving them this, in, this vital information. It's so important. So how can people find you and what's the best way to keep in touch with you? Right. Um, everything can be gone to or found through my personal website, leslieferrisyerger.com. You know, so you can book me for a speech or buy my book or email me um, or look at a website that I've curated called My Density Matters. And that is all going to have, uh, you know, Facebook and Instagram, you know, uh, LinkedIn and Twitter, you know, feed to it. So that's another way that I'm now beginning to really, you know, get out to other people is through social media. Um, but that can all be linked to through leslieferrisyerger.com. Nice. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'll put... I would love it if anybody reaches out and has questions. I'm, I'm all about that. So. <laughs> yeah. I'll put all that information in the show notes. And thank you again so much for being on the show. I really appreciate your sharing your story with us and telling us how we can better care for our breasts to avoid getting cancer. All right. Really thank you. Sending you lots of love. Thank you so much. Right back to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. Yeah, Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe and tune in on Tuesdays for new episodes. For more information about me, please follow me on Instagram at Corinne J. Camara and my website, CorinneCamara.com. Sending you lots of infinite love.